that I would like to uh, talk to you about today. Again, uh, if you're interested in more discussions, uh, you're welcome to contact me as well as um, I am happy to come to your place of business or wherever, uh, schools, whatever, and discuss this further. Oh, thanks very much. Are we up and running? Yay. Hooray. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so let me just take my time here to see where we are. Okay, so um, good. We're not too bad. Um, okay, so uh, let me just make sure, because this is a new system for me, that I understand how to work this. Uh, let's see, just so that I can toggle my slides here. Excuse me, please. Okay, the mouse is not responsive. Oh, there it is. Okay, um, it's not showing up on my screen is the problem. I'm sorry, will I require your assistance for a moment, please? Um, do you see I cannot find it here? Oh, there we go. Okay, I must use a touchpad. Oh, I think. Uh, all right. Okay. okay, so what do I do? The mouse. Oh, what happened? Sorry, guys. Okay, so the mouse will work there. The mouse is just on that screen. So Brilliant. Saying. Thanks Thanks very much. Okay, so we're going to um, uh, skip this because, of course, I've already talked to you. I've already talked to you about... Oh, wait. Okay, I understand. It's showing me next slide. All right, forgive me. It's just a technology problem here. Um, this is the little show that uh, TCT did on my work. It is a 45-minute documentary, but um, I'm going to just show you a, l a little bit of it uh, to properly introduce myself to you. Um, and you know what? To make up the time, actually, I'm thinking about this, to make up the time that we've lost, I'm going to skip that. The DVD is available to you if you want to watch my show, and it's also online. So. Um, Forgive me, it is a good demonstration of, um, of uh, autism. I wanted to discuss this with you, but for time, we're going to skip this. Uh, we have already discussed this. Now, before we get started, I want to um, talk about the premise of any, uh, anything I feel is respect. And because I think in pictures, um, I have uh, asked Mr. Barrett if he would allow me to use his fine art photography today to share with you uh, his photograph called Respect. And you can see there, uh, it, he calls it the ability to understand that we are all reflections of each other in one manner or another, and that most differences arise in the manner that feeling and actions are chosen to be communicated both verbally and non-verbally. Um, Mr. Barrett, has used his art in, as a means of communicating the significance that our increasingly multicultural society has on the human condition. Uh, these, year, uh, these photographs are years of in-depth analysis and exploration into the interaction between the relationships of the subject matters existing. And, and uh, I appreciate very much that he has allowed me to uh, use his lovely photograph demonstrating respect today. Um, it is something to have you think about as we discuss what we're going to cover today. Um, I, it is very important also that we look at the idea of equality, diversity, and globalization. Uh, as our world changes, our society must be reconfigured uh, as a culture, a society, and science under the tremendous impact of globalization. So I ask you this question, what does it mean to think and act globally, and how does it affect the disabled? Um, interculturally, with increasing globalization, dealing successfully with cultural diversity, which would include the disabled, uh, in various thinking and behavior patterns is becoming a key to competence in business and administration, as well as a major topic for research. So, uh, when I say this, that uh, I love to go to different countries and uh, discover their models for uh, diversity and equality within the uh, way it affects the disabled. Each country is quite different. Uh, I will tell you, it is extremely different everywhere you go. And uh, again, we must catch up by reconstructing uh, as a global um, globalization uh, occurs in our world that uh, we have consistency uh, in our ways. Um, 
Currently, the United States has a view on disability as a social construct. The EU right now, uh, the European Union rather, is in the process and the consequences of de deconstructing disability. And yes, there are consequences for this. But it is well worth the look of different models and constructions of different kinds of disabilities in different societies at different times in history the psychological consequences of encountering and living with disability, intersections of disability, gender, race, class, as well as applied questions such as debates on human rights and inclusion. So uh, I ask you as we go on, besides to think about respect, I ask you to think also about the importance of uh, this as it affects the disabled community. Okay, so two days ago, you have uh, Autism Day. Um, there are enough of us now that uh, it is recognized that um, we must have a day to, to uh, recognize this. And uh, did you know that uh, more children are diagnosed each year than juvenile dis diabetes, AIDS, or cancer combined? Uh, I also want you to note that uh, the autism spectrum disorders, there are over 2 million individuals in the US alone and tens of millions worldwide. So I ask you this, are we a minority at this point? There is more than one of us in this room and it is not because I am the one talking about it and have it. I guarantee you there is somebody else in this room and you could be sitting next to them. Uh, it is an invisible disability and it is a very important uh, thing that we know that there are so, so many of us now. Um, uh, all right, so um, one of the things that I want to discuss really briefly is this, you'll note, is a picture of Dublin. Um, last spring, I attended a, a symposium of sorts about autism. And I will tell you that um, there were good speakers, there are many experts. <clears throat> I might have been the only one in the room that had autism, I don't know. But uh, this man uh, was speaking about the education system and how important it is that we, um, as a whole, uh, do away with bullying, um, do uh, things you know that need to be adjusted in the education system for the autistic. And he, uh, we were getting ready to break for lunch, and uh, this uh, gentleman said, "What we hope for is that the autistic." we will see in a society that they are better tolerated. And I went, whoa, <laughs> that did not sit well with me. I stopped because now he asked for questions and then we were to break for lunch. And I raise, I, I raise up and I say, excuse me, please, will I say this back to you and I want you to take it personal. I hope for you that you are better tolerated someday. And I hope that he understood we are not something to be tolerated. I am just as valuable, just as equal as any other person. So let me tell you, the parents in that room, when we broke for lunch, were not surrounding this man for questions. They were surrounding me because they understood that I understand how valuable their child is and uh, that it, uh, you know, this is important. Okay, so we move on. Um, are the needs of the autistic optional? Um, right, so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just getting used to the different computer here. Um, uh, right now, I cannot qualify for disability, the way the standards are written. Uh, if I had a brain injury and I could not keep my job, I could qualify. But the fact that uh, I have a checkered resume because I don't understand the social constructs and politics and things like this in a office place that make me not fit in quite as well. I cannot win the popularity contest. And um, despite the good work that I do, uh, they just say, look, we're sorry, you're lovely, but we don't want you at the end of my three-month probation, three probation period. Um, so um, uh, right now, what do I do to eat? You don't want me. I am brilliant. I do good work. But you don't want me, so uh, I go to the government to say, please, will you help me? And they say, no, I'm sorry, uh, you, you qualify, uh, you, you don't qualify because um, you can actually get a job. 
right, okay, so this is a problem, so now we end up homeless. And uh, only 15% of autistic have full-time jobs. But if you think about the numbers I quoted you, how many of us then are without jobs? Because we are not valued, we are not looked at as equals. We are not uh, seen for our incredible talents and gifts. There is many different ways to handle autism. One of the models is called Americanization. Now, by the pictures, and remember I think in pictures, so you're seeing my way of telling you this. Uh, you have the rhino and the zebra, and uh, if you paint the rhino to look like a zebra, you still have a rhino. Uh, Dr. Grace Hebert at the University of Wyoming uh, many years ago uh, tried to handle the problem of uh, the immigrant, the problem. Uh, the people that come to America that do not act like Americans, that do not have the same culture and ways and behaviors. She said, we must stop this. So she set up classes and uh, she called it Americanization to teach you how to become an American, to teach you how to act and behave and value things and prioritize as Americans do. Right, this sounds lovely, doesn't it? You know, now we are all uh, one equal society, but uh, what about the repression of the individual and their culture and their own self that goes away. You see, you still have the rhino, it's painted with a stripe at the end of the day. Uh, this is not a good model to respect the equality and diversity that is found in our world. There is another strategy, it is called the EU Disability Strategy. Uh, it is, you can see the list there, accessibility, participation, equality, employment, and so on. Um, I do want to uh, point out the definition, actual definition of two of these, as they are very critical to understand. Uh, specifically, number two, participation. Ensure that people with disabilities enjoy all benefits of, of citizenship remove barriers to equal participation in public life and leisure activities, promote the provision of quality community-based services. So these people are going to be part of every community if this works. Uh, number six is also one I would like to point out to you, please. Social protection, promote decent living conditions, combat poverty and social exclusion. Um, so, uh, you can do more research on your own, there is so much, but uh, I only have time for this today. What is the biggest loss uh, when society excludes us, when they don't employ us? Um, the, the biggest loss is hidden to you. Uh, look at the list, modern day confirmed as autistic is on one side, and past day suspected as having autism is on the other. So I will just talk about the last list. Uh, look at uh, Abe Lincoln is on there, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Darwin, Orwell, Yeats, Beethoven, Mozart. Okay, so these people give you what? Uh, and what can I give you that if I am homeless, I, can, I am no longer uh, giving my gift to the world? Um, so the biggest loss is not, oh, the dollars that governments have to spend or things like this. It is our talents, our brilliance, because we are some of the greatest inventors in the world because of the way our brains work. You will never have what I was supposed to invent if I am homeless, and that is your loss. Uh, this is a very big problem for society that is not recognized. So what do we have for today's autistic children? If you were born in the last 10 years, you have a great advantage over me. You will have early diagnosis, possibly. You will have speech pathology, which, by the way, I am very uh, concerned about this, and I will talk about this if we have time. Uh, speech pathology is, um, uh, well, we will talk about this later. Uh, you have special diets being recognized. Uh, you have teacher's aides trained to help the autistic. You have mental health evaluations and feedback, uh, you know, for a ring of professionals trying to help this child. Uh, but you also have things like bullying still and you have uh, negative reactions to children's or adult meltdowns. And by the way, I have a little note here. Please note that if you know somebody with autism on the spectrum, consider having suggesting to them that they wear a bracelet, an autism alert bracelet, or carrying an autism alert card. Because there is going to be a time when that child or teenager or adult cannot 
tell you what is happening. They are in a meltdown, they are not understood, and if they can show this bracelet, hopefully they will get some grace from the society that is being uh, judgmental in a way that they cannot possibly understand what is wrong with this person. Um, right, so we move on. Um, foreign lands. Uh, I will tell you that uh, being autistic is like being in a foreign land. Um, I have a brochure here that they picked up from the International Department. Um, if you were to go to travel, uh, you, as a woman, to a foreign land, you might pick up this brochure that says women, what you need to know abroad. It says the keys to foreign travel are to be informed, seek advice, and control your own behavior. Now, I live in a world that is designed by the non-autistic. Okay, so I'm in a foreign land. I don't understand. Most of it is nonsense to me. Um, I actually uh, feel quite lost most of the time, and it creates a lot of anxiety and stress for me. Um, so seeking advice and having this accessible from a professional support team is very critical for us. Uh, I also want you to think about the idea that um, if you are in a foreign land and you want advice about this place, you will find a person from that foreign land. You will not ask another American, for example, because they're as lost as you. Uh, so when you're seeking advice for autism, would it not make sense to consult an out-of-the-closet autistic person like myself? Because I am the only one that can really give you the inside look to our culture, to our very unique culture. You can read about us, you can study us, uh, but I understand from the inside what it is like and so I would like to see, and I think this is so big, please don't underestimate what I'm saying here. I would like to see um, a time in our world where the collaboration of the non-autistic professionals who seek to help the autistic and the out-of-the-closet autistic come together and, and join up to make a better world for those on the spectrum. It is so critical. So today's autistic adults are shaped through late or no diagnosis. So for example, myself, I was born in the dark ages of autism. Unless I was a savant, or maybe you think about Rain Man, uh, if you've seen this movie. Um, this was the autistic, and we were locked up. So uh, I did not come as a savant. I was higher functioning than that, but actually I, did, I am not able to to actually talk, you think, right, we hear your words, what are you saying to me? I actually think in pictures, so the only way I learned to talk was to record, and I play recordings very quickly now, so that I don't appear stupid. Um, you're looking at a non-verbal autistic person that through much hard work and cognitive modification, I am able to give you this talk today. Uh, but let me ask you, would it not be better to take a little two-year-old or four or five or six-year-old who has delayed speech and uh, rather than force them to use a language that is not natural to them, why wouldn't we use sign language? Because this is a pictorial language. The Native Americans understood this. Between tribes, they say, we use pictures and we all will understand this. In the EU, you will find instruction sheets nowadays. There is not one word it is only pictures, because now they can mail this to any country and everybody will understand. So why are we forced with words? Because they are not our language. Is this not disrespectful to us and the way our brains work? Um, I have a problem with this. And speech pathology, by the way, it is very ineffective most of the time. Uh, it would be equal to teaching my dog here to meow. He could maybe croak out that sound, but what would it mean for him? Uh, I only use recordings uh, for you today. Um, now I want to give you a good demonstration of this. It is a, a, a TV show in Ireland, uh, and uh, there is one character that is not officially autistic, but I recognize him. His, his casted role is autistic, okay? And this is a lovely demonstration of uh, how, the, uh, how trying to force words on us does not work. I will show you this. Oh, 
this is a technical difficulty. There. Okay, one last time. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> Small, far away. <laughs> the idea and did you notice his frustration uh, that he could not make this person understand? This is what we accomplished uh, to you is nothing. But you're not speaking our language. If you want to teach me that that cow that is this big is different than the one I'm seeing in the distance on the hillside. This is not the way you do it for me. You don't speak this way with me. I will not understand. And you will become frustrated and you will crush me as a being. You are not respecting my, my uh, right to have equality and diversity when you speak to me this way, you see. And this is what speech pathology really is. If you wanted to teach me how the cows are small and far away, I could tell you, but we don't have time today. It is, a, it is very quite simple, but we don't have this time. Today's autistic adults are shaped through uh, the... Wait, no, look. Uh, I think we covered this. I don't know. Uh, okay, well, the, um, I want to bring your attention to this uh, show in the UK. It is called The Undateables. Now, you can see on the picture there is a guy on the uh, one side, he has a skateboarding accident, he is very disfigured. A uh, woman in the wheelchair, there's a person in this picture you wouldn't know it, but there's a guy with Tourette's. Uh, there's a person with Asperger's syndrome, which is an autistic spectrum disorder. And forgive me for those who do not know what autism are, I was going to cover this in the uh, little clip at the beginning that we must skip, so forgive me. Um, but uh, autism spectrum disorders can also be called such things such as Asperger's syndrome. Um, so you get the idea. Now, they want under vicious attack from the media. Oh, how can you say that this man with this disfigured face is uh, undateable? How dare you label him this, right? It sounds so good. And look at, their, uh, look at what the company says back. The title is a reflection of society's own perceptions and intended to challenge the stereotypes and encourage debate. They're saying, excuse me, this is what you label these people, not us. And they have a right to have love and happiness just as much as you. Do you think the man with this disfigured face had 30 women beating down his door on any given day? This is your label for him, not theirs. Uh, as a society, because equality and diversity are not where they need to be. We are not valued inside. We still look as a society on these other things and expect these things and say, this is what is acceptable and attracted uh, to these things. Okay, so what does this do to our dignity? Nothing to do with Dana. Anyway, you're past 10 now. Oh, all right. But I should get out and do what I want, Ted. I am nearly 26, you know. You still treat me like I was 24. <laughs> so what do you do? I start treating you like a 26 year old when you start acting like a 26 year old. Anyway, it's time for your bath. No! <laughs> This is sarcasm, but uh, it is a lovely way to say that uh, if I go to a job and I tell you I'm autistic and you treat me like I'm three, it is going to make my dignity suffer. I am smart, I am not stupid, um, but I will not understand when you tell me, oh, by the way, I drove 100 miles an hour to work today because I was late. I will take you very serious and I will say, write back, you shouldn't write it as fast, you know, it is dangerous and you'll be getting an accident and then you'll be later. And the person is now aware you're different. And this is why I'm not kept. This is why at the end of my three month probation, because I say this in a caring, all serious manner, not understanding this person didn't really drive 100 miles an hour, I'm not acceptable to come to your company now because of this comment. And I will be thrown on the street for it, you see. So uh, it is very harsh, uh, and again, equality and diversity must, uh, uh, the reconstruction of society for equality and diversity must happen. We are very awkward socially. I want to demonstrate an example, and it, this could, this is not sarcasm. This is absolutely possible, absolutely. And you will see the awkwardness of the character at the end. To China! Hooray! To China! Hooray! 
to Craggy Island. Hey! More drink. Hey! I'm sorry, the bar's closed. Hey! I want everyone to be back to my place for a drink. Hey! Wait, I need to go to the toilet first. Thankful they're all so drunk that they don't catch this awkward moment. <laughs> but uh, you can see there are many unspoken and unwritten uh, social roles that are lost on the autistic, and the cost to us is uh, possibly our ability to eat. Uh, so uh, think about these things. Um, autistic employees and the people pound this slide. Uh, I often feel that I am like a dog that didn't behave properly, and so you throw me in the shelter. No, we don't want you. Uh, I am ca constantly cast into the people pound. No, your behavior, we don't like this comment from you, even though it was not unkind, rude, illegal, or any way this, you know, a problem. You're different. So go away. You know, this is the problem uh, at work. And again, only 15% of the autistic are employed full-time, typically speaking. And uh, it is not uncommon for us to have 40 jobs over 15 years, 15 years, not 50, uh, because of this problem that we cannot find acceptance and our brilliance is lost on our society. We are not the great inventors when we are cast out. So this is an example I tell you about uh, the literal parts of our brain. He's just a shadow of a sheep. <laughs> That's a nice tale. If I was a sheep, I'd be watching my back right now. <laughs> because of the beast, and the same as big as four cats, that has got a retractable leg so it can leap up to them. And you know what, Ted? It lights up at night. It's got four ears. Two of them are for listening, and the other two are kind of backup ears. Its claws are as big as cups, and for some reason, it's got a tremendous fear of stamps. This is the one that was telling me that it's got magnets on its tail. So it's like a red out of metal, it can attach itself to you. And instead of about, it's got four arses. <laughs> it's a legend, it doesn't exist. Right, Ted. The way the Phantom of the Opera doesn't exist. The Phantom of the Opera doesn't exist. I'm not going to get into this what doesn't exist and what doesn't exist debate again. Okay? But I'm going to have to insist you add those last two examples to the chart. But oh, Ted, do go! <laughs> this little chart, you know, things like Darth Vader, uh, you know, <laughs> things like this on it. And so, uh, if you tell us something, we believe it. We are very gullible and naive. We are very vulnerable because of this. Um, we take you literally. And uh, this would be a, a, a fun little way to demonstrate that to you. Um, all right, so we move on. Uh, the, the, I, I have the term that I call leper's syndrome. Um, as a child, you would find me like this picture that you see uh, on the sideline of the playground, uh, wondering what in the world these children are doing. Why, as these two girls over, uh, you know, to the left of the boy, you know, together and touching each other like this, and what could they possibly be seeing fun? Uh, completely lost on me. I find it all nonsense what goes on in the playground, and I am just completely not included because of this. This is not fun for me, what they do, and to me, they look like wild monkeys most of the time that were... Uh, not happy individuals, and yet they think this is fun. I, I don't understand. So you can see that there needs to be a program uh, in schools and uh, even as adults, our own worlds of work and things like this, to help people on the spectrum break out of social inclusion or homelessness. We must have that transition. So what is my transition? It is this right here, this lovely sleeping creature, uh, my dog Buster. He is my bridge. He drags me to you. Uh, this dog is, uh, 
he helps me uh, practice my social skills and boundaries, and thus he helps cure my leper syndrome. Because guess what? Anywhere I go, uh, many people come to talk to me about this dog. Now I get to talk to you, and I never would have otherwise. So now I have to learn eye contact, I get to practice uh, my uh, recordings, I get to I get to have a feeling that I am no longer in solitary confinement. This is so important for me, and I could not do it without him. I absolutely could not do it. For the first time in my life, I can practice these things. I get him only last year. What could I be if I had gotten him at age six? Well, he would be dead now, of course, but you understand my point. Uh, I am here talking to you today because this dog gave me my wings. I traveled to five countries last year for the first time in my life because I had the courage now because of my friend. I had gone back to college to finish my degree, something I would not have done if it was not for my friend. Uh, what he helps me do also is when I'm in a meltdown, I have been hit by a car because the world goes away when we are in a meltdown. And so I have been hit. This is dangerous for me. And so he has saved my life twice in Dublin last year, uh, one after exams, and I'm so fried. Um, so uh, this dog is very important for me, as you can see. Uh, he also reminds me to be peaceful because, look, he is just such a stressed ball, isn't he? I mean, you look at this, it's like a fireplace, you know, to watch. Um, he allows me to nurture myself, uh, and he allows uh, me to have a friend that supports me as I go through this world that I don't understand. It is a bunch of nonsense to me. Um, so uh, my success is largely dependent on him as I progress in this world. And uh, it is him that you can thank for this discussion today, because I would not be here if it was not for him in many ways, not only literally, physically, with my heart beating, but my confidence would not have been there. And he is the calm friend. Now, this is uh, pictures of different whippets. Actually, uh, there is a daughter of Buster and a son of Buster in that picture. And one was a rescue that I was fostering to give to somebody. But you can see the whippet is a lovely, peaceful dog. And it is very important for us to have this as the autistic because it is a very stressful time for us to be in the world we don't understand. Um, the autistic are outsiders always trying to get into your non-autistic world. Guess what? It gets really draining for us, and we often don't succeed. But he tries to get in to me. And this is something I need. Um, if a dog like this is overwhelmed and shutting down, then I should not be there either. Uh, they survive trauma by becoming calmer, this breed uh, so when there is horrible gales of wind in Ireland, he would curl up on the bed and just be quiet. And this helps me keep calm as well. Whippets need far less training. Whippets rarely ever bite or bark. In fact, I don't think there is one known case of a whippet ever biting a human being. Uh, they are safe for our society, therefore. Uh, whereas I know two uh, certified service dogs last year alone that bit people. They were not whippets, they were Labradors. Uh, whippets don't have a doggy smell or loads of hair. Now, I ride the train in Dublin. Uh, it is a small space. Do you want a large, hairy, wet Labradoodle with loads of hair sitting two inches from your face as I sit next to you? I don't think so. Uh, you want this little tidy package with no smell and no, no problems, you see. Uh, I travel on airplanes with him, lecture halls, uh, Bosses, uh, the tidy size is quite critical, you know. Uh, whippets need very little exercise. They are naturally house dogs. They are, this is their natural environment. They are not upset by being in this room. Um, they are bred to be giving life to hand. Uh, so in Ireland, they are used for lamping. Uh, they take a, a, what you call a flashlight, and uh, they shine it on the rabbit. The, they bring the rabbit back to the man live to hand. They don't kill it. Um, and they, they are taught, you will give your prey uh, to us. Uh, so they have a very giving nature. They're soft and giving. Um, and uh, so they are very happy to uh, serve and give to you. Um, so uh, I wanted to just kind of give you an idea of why I feel the Sighthound group in general is very good for the autistic compared to other breeds. 
Um, why would I use something bred, let's say a Labrador, that is bred for a minimum of eight miles of exercise a day when all service dogs do is wait, 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 wait? Is it fair to do this to a Labrador, uh, to suppress him this way? Is he a slave or is he my partner at that point? I want a willing partner. I want a dog who is happy to be with me. Everything is too loud, smells are too strong, and things are too bright for the autistic. Uh, you see a picture here of the storybook tale, The Princess and the Pea. Everything we feel too much. So again, we have no noise filter, and he helps me when I have meltdowns because of this in my nervous system. Uh, here he is pictured at a college in Dublin. Um, this shows he must have patience on the train. This is the train in Dublin. If he makes one move, he will be stepped on and possibly not welcome. Uh, and his little tidy, content size, you know, again, you see this. Uh, this is a cafe in Ireland. Again, if he is a big, hairy, gross, uh, you know, not calm dog, he will not be welcome to sit uh, in the booth with me in the cafe in Ireland. At uh, the chiropractor, um, he's welcome the grocery store. Uh, if you see a working dog, a service dog, please do not disturb them. So many people see my dog and they see the little sign on his vest that says no petting, but um, they sit and talk to him. Oh, hello, you're so lovely. Oh, you're so cute. I love you. You're so beautiful. Right, and he is no longer focusing on me now, is he? He's still on you. Uh, please do not talk, look, or touch a service dog. It is a wheelchair. And so many people that love dogs feel rude if they don't address this dog. Uh, it is okay for you to treat my dog like a wheelchair. This is what I want from you. He is equal to the cane that the blind man uses or the wheelchair. Um, he is not considered the dog that you think he is. And he cannot do his job for me if he is uh, being talked to, pet, looked, you know, these things. He is distracted and he cannot save me from the boss that I walk out in front of when you're talking to him. The best thing you could do for an autistic person is to give us advocacy, somebody that we can come with a problem. And you say, don't worry, leave it with me. I pick this angel picture that is resting because you will be an angel to us and allow us rest if you will help us sort our problems. Because remember, we don't understand this world. My goals are to see equality and diversity uh, rise, and I would like to be an advocate of this and a presenter. Uh, I would like to make an autistic retreat, an education center, with site town selection and placement on site as well. I would like to give life skill courses to the autistic to help them understand better how they can function in this world. And I also do one-to-one -one consultations. I would love to come talk to your group, as we've already discussed, and I would like to see the autistic more than anything in the world as the important contributors they are to helping the autistic. Right now, we are not at the table of professionals when you're making a plan for an autistic child. Why not? I am the one that understands best. I would like to also write a book. Uh, that's it uh, for today. So um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, uh, do we? Oh, we do. Lovely. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, yes, right here. Yes. Oh, lovely. Yes, of course, please. Um, it was very hard for me because I was born in the dark ages, you know, where it's just savants that are autistic, you know. To be recognized um, as autistic, I was just a strange child, a shy child, whatever labels. And uh, I was not able to get uh, information about myself until I met Dr. Temple Grandin, who was speaking, um, as I am today, uh, and she explained her world. And I went, there's somebody else like, like me. And I recognized this. And so I researched and tried to get diagnosed. It was impossible for me for 10 years to find somebody that would look at an adult. Because remember, we outgrow this. Uh, not true at all. So um, this is for our ch children today. Everybody goes, oh yes, children, children, children. We diagnose them. I couldn't find a person that could understand an adult because we have many layers of uh, trying to uh, function in this world. And it is hard for the person without the trained eye to see an adult as autistic. 
So I had to actually get diagnosed from a expert uh, at Trinity College in a different country in Ireland. Uh, I finally found what I needed through this man. He is an autistic expert. He is a professor at Trinity College, and he is a psychologist. Uh, sorry, the word is not in my word, uh, head. Psy psychotherapist? No. Um, what is the one that can prescribe medication? Psychiatrist, thank you. See, I still find problems with words. He is that. And he, oh, I was classic case for him, you know, because he knows what he's looking at, you see. So um, that is why it took me till age 42 to get diagnosed. Does that answer your question? Thank you for asking. Will I take another question? Is there any others? Yes, please. IEP meeting. I have not had the experience because we are not invited to these things. I would love to if, absolutely, it would be my pleasure and honor. Thank you. Will I take another? Uh, will I take another question? Anybody have any other questions? Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about the insight as to our world? Because you see, uh, in my presentation, I had many sides that I did not share with you today because of fear of time. Um, does anybody have any questions as to what it is like for us? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, if you want to teach me the words small and far away, because uh, does everybody remember this or shall I replay the clip? You're all good. Okay. If you want this replayed, raise your hand. Okay. So, um, pretend I have the cow. Um, I will use uh, this, it is my cow. Okay, so you want to teach me small and far away. So, uh, remember, the cow looks the same in your hand as the cow in the distance for me, right? And I think in pictures, so I match the two pictures, like the game Pictionary, if you understand this from being a child. Um, so, to me, that's the same. Why do they have two different words? And I don't care about the word anyway, remember? So, what you're going to do is you need to have another cow that is larger. Same looking cow. You can even do a picture and just blow it up, right? So it's exactly the same. Now, you teach me first, the little, the little picture is small. And the uh, bigger cow, same thing though, it must be the same, the pictures must match, is large. Now, you must then take one of the two cows, I don't care which one you use, probably the small one would be best because it's more consistent, it depends on the functioning level and you will walk it away from me, and I won't do it, but let's say I set it down way over there. Now my picture matches, and you say, when it is there, it is now called far away. So you are literally helping me assign through pictures. First I must have the reference point of small and large. Now I must have the reference point of far away, but you must actually show me. You must say, I'm taking the same cow, and I'm walking it over there. Do you see it was the same cow? But when it is not close to me anymore, I now call it a different word. Uh, I want to give you an example of this uh, different perception. Uh, there is a handicap writing program that I was a voluntary worker for. Uh, there was a girl. She was autistic, OK? And, uh, sorry, excuse me, just a moment, my throat is getting dry. <clears throat> okay, her name was Emily. She um, never lets people touch her, talk to her, she doesn't want this. And uh, so I was very, I understand this, because I have it myself, right? I understand this world. So I was very good with her, naturally. She went to her mother, and she explained in her way, I want this woman to come to eat with us. So I, I was invited to their home for dinner. So uh, the girl, Emily, she, I was sitting down at the table. She saw a card with a beautiful black and white horse on the front. Um, and she bring it to her mother. And she set it down in front of her. And uh, the mother said, uh, right, OK, so this is a happy birthday card to me from Aunt Susie. And it says, happy birthday to you. Uh, hope your day is wonderful, love, Aunt Susie. And I look at Emily's face, and she's like, N this, nothing. And I know what the problem is. And I say, ha, she thinks in pictures, hello. Okay, this horse 
is on this because your mother loves horses. And I show her a smile on my face and holding up the card. And then I show it smile on my, uh, her mother's, I tell her mother, please smile. And I hand it next to her face so she can take a picture of her mother smiling with the horse next to her face. Now she understands this horse picture makes her mother happy. Now, I say, another woman gives this to your mother to make her smile. And she never touched anybody before in her life other than her mother. I didn't know if I did anything, really. But all of a sudden, I am hugged so hard, I could hardly stand it behind me. She comes up behind me and gives me a huge hug. And she fairly drags me out of my chair and drags me to her room. And now she's showing me everything, pointing everything. I just opened the world for her, and I just entered her world. And this is the first time in her 17 years that anybody ever understood her and how to explain that card. She doesn't care about the words on this card. She doesn't care it's about the birthdays. She doesn't even know these things. She doesn't want to know these things. She wants, she thinks in pictures, she wants to know why the horse is on there. And so I explain this to her. So when you understand pictures, the sky is the limit for us. So if you want to teach me small and far away, or large, or any of these other things, you must do it in pictures. You must do it in my language. You must allow me to take a snapshot of you holding the little cow, you holding the big cow, and then you having the cow far away. So speech pathology, um, it is hard. Uh, oh, and sorry. Yes, oh, good, we have time. I wanted to give you a very good example, if I could, of Donna Williams um, for everybody. Um, this is a story of a little girl. Uh, Donna Williams was volunteering at a place. Uh, that has special needs children, and I hate that word special needs, but uh, okay, so it says, um, entering the infant room, I saw a girl about four years old curled up in the dark interior of a crate. Her eyes were sharply crossed, her fists clenched into balls. The staff had been advised that in the safety of her self-controlled isolation, she might begin to explore her surroundings. Hung inside the crate were various mobiles and objects. The two supervising staff were excited by the novelty of their ideas and the equipment for the little girl. Like over-enthusiastic relatives on the first meeting with a newborn child, they were half in the tiny crate with her. I stood there, and remember this is Donna Williams who is autistic, remember she understands this world. I stood there feeling ill as they bombarded her personal space with their bodies, their breath, their smells, their laughter, their movement, and their noise. Almost mechanically, they shook rattles and jiggled things in front of the girl as if they were a pair of overzealous witch doctors hoping to break the evil spell on her uh, autism. Their interpretation of the advice seemed to be an overdose of her and experiences that they, in their infinite the world wisdom, would bring to her. I got the feeling that if they could have used a tire jack to pry open her soul and pour the world in, they would have done so and never would have noticed that their patient had died on the operating table. The little girl screamed and rocked in response, her arms up against her ears to keep their noise out and her eyes crossed to block out the bombardment of visual noise. I watched these people and wished they knew what sensory hell was. I was watching a torture where the victim had no ability to fight back in any comprehensible language. I stood almost numb with shock. She had no words to put to what was happening, to analyze, to adjust to it as they did. As far as introducing her to a safe, peaceful, consistent, and controlled place in the world, it looked like a shattering first imp impression. It was medieval at best. These people had been told to use something that might work, but, but no one had told them why or how. So, why is the autistic not being consulted? This is the perfect example. I must be at the table as well. When you are making the plan for autistic, an out-of-the-closet autistic person must be there as well. If it is not happening, this is the horror that can happen for us. And there are many examples, lovely examples of this in this book. Uh, it is a very good book. Again, Donna Williams, somebody somewhere, she has many books. 
I find she surpasses Dr. Temple Grandin in many ways, especially for educators and professionals that really want to understand. Uh, so please do your research uh, with this if you are interested in hearing more about it. Is there any other questions? Yes, please. Oh, lovely. Oh, it's a gorgeous question. Uh, yes, I have time for this. Um, I found Bother in a little, uh, in the middle of Ireland, in County Tipperary. Uh, I wanted to have his foundation be quite different from that that I saw the normal service dogs had that makes them crack. I wanted a willing partner. So Bolster was living with a family of four lovely children. And Bolster was given to a four-year-old boy with the same name. He is named after this boy. His real name was Shane, but his family called him Bolster. So my dog is named after this boy in his honor. Uh, Bolster, um, the little boy Bolster, was to raise this dog for two years. Because what he needs to understand is how to form a close bond with his pack. If he cannot have the opportunity to bond, he will be of no use to me. And this is his one job. Children keep it simple. And their job was to grow up together in the simple countryside in County Tipperary. So when I get him at age two, uh, Bolster, the little boy who was now six, hands him to me. And uh, they were not allowed, I have one, one request from them, no leash was allowed. If you don't have a willing partner, you are not doing your job right. So um, Bolster comes from this lovely home uh, in County Tipperary uh, with a very solid uh, foundation where he was never forced with too much information. He was allowed to grow up. And he was allowed to learn a secureness that comes with him. So that now, when I take him into Dublin, and we are in madness, and he is calm, and he sees the boss that I don't, and he can pull me back. This dog does not need that training. He is not stupid any more than I am. Uh, I might be in meltdown, but he's not. And because he had a lovely foundation. And so he knows. There's a boss coming. We must get out of here. He has been known to take pencils out of my hand when I am in class because he smells my chemicals changing that I'm starting to melt down. And he will take it, set it on the table, and he will force me to leave. He will hand me my hat, literally. So uh, he finds different ways to tell me when I must leave. He has the freedom to do that. This is not a trained robot. If I don't have a hat that day, then he'll find a different way. If I'm not writing, then he'll find another way. But he always signals me very subtly at first. And if I ignore him, or I'm too melting down to understand this, I can't, he goes away as well for me. And he becomes very, very animated about this. <laughs> he will do whatever he has to do. He will tip things over. He will say, excuse me, you're leaving. So this has been an amazing uh, thing. And he is so solid. Solid. He outperformed a, a high-trained dog in Germany at an airport with, that was doing a bomb check as we sat and wait. My dog was so calm, that dog was falling apart. It, it, it is critical, this foundation, that uh, you know, is, is uh, there for him. So does that answer your question? Anybody else have a question? Well, we are a couple of minutes from time up anyway. So um, I want to thank you for coming today to give the autistic a voice. By hearing me, you have taken this in. And I hope that you have learned something today. Um, I am available for your questions. If you would like um, to give me your contact information, you are very welcome to do that. Again, I have DVDs for free if you want to watch my 45-minute documentary. And I also have business cards. So you're very welcome for that as well. Um, but I want to thank you for that. And I hope I've given you a little bit of an introduction today, touching on things from social policy to uh, what this is like for us. You know. So um, thanks very much. I appreciate your time. Organizing a class.